Welcome into another episode of Locked On Phillies. In today's episode, we're going to discuss the Phillies offseason and why I told you this from Jump Street. You had to let Dave Dombrowski have his time. Also, we'll look at some of the stats compiled from spring training so far. Who's tearing it up? Who's been on a bit of a slide? Who should we be looking at to potentially make a push for a roster spot? And finally, on today's episode, 23 days until opening day, who's the best number 23 from Philadelphia Phillies history? Well, it's a World Series champion from years going by. Who could that be? Well, I'll tell you more on today's episode. Let's get started. You are locked on Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked On Phillies. I'm Connor Thomas, your host. Thank you so much for checking us out. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And please make sure you're rating and reviewing wherever you consume your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube and haven't subscribed yet, that's the number one way to support us here on Locked on Phillies. So we'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to the YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. And I want to take the time now that we have the news of Zach Wheeler's contract extension. He signed a three-year contract extension yesterday, annual value of $42 million when that kicks in, which will be the 2025 season. This season, he's still under his previous contract agreement, and then he'll have three more years, so 2025, 2026, and 2027 will all be taken care of uh, by way of this extension. But with that news, we've kind of come to the completion of the Philadelphia Phillies offseason, I want to say. I really think that puts them at a point where there is nothing more that they're going to do for a couple reasons. First of all, we talked about it on yesterday's episode, but this is going to almost guarantee them to be, not this year, but next year, in the highest luxury tax threshold because of the Zach Wheeler contract on top of all the other big contracts. Like they're going to be maxed out on luxury tax, which means they're going to be a lot more hesitant to try and sign other big name guys whose contracts carry over more than one year. And I don't see the Phillies giving a one year deal to anybody out there in free agency unless there's like a bullpen arm, maybe, and that won't be like a splash move. Now they could still make a trade, but I would be willing to wager that the big moves of the Philadelphia Phillies offseason have come and gone. They're already completed. This is basically how the team's going to look like when we get to opening day. Maybe a slight tweak here or there, but I'd be surprised if there's any other like noteworthy transactions by the Phillies before opening day. And all offseason, I was getting comments. I was getting tweets. I was getting stopped in the street. I was getting asked on the radio. I was getting all these people asking me, well, why are the Phillies not doing anything? Uh, what are they just running it back? How can they do this? How can they not try and improve the roster? All this stuff about criticizing the Phillies not being active enough in free agency. Now let's take a deep breath and look at what the Philadelphia Phillies did. In free agency, or rather during this offseason, the Philadelphia Phillies did a couple of things. They have handled conversations about a potential Bryce Harper extension the correct and safest way. We'll get to it when we get to it. Not disrespectful to Bryce, acknowledging that they wanted to be here forever. Uh, that is more a logistics thing as far as uh, keeping a player somewhat relatively happy. And I think Bryce Harper is happy to be here. But if they had given Bryce Harper an extension this offseason, I think that would have been jumping the gun. And it would have been putting something higher up on the priority list than should have been done. So check on that point. They needed to re-sign Aaron Nola. They just had to. It, like He wanted to be here. They were going to probably get him at a better deal than other players because he's homegrown here in Philadelphia and wants to remain in the city and play somewhere he feels comfortable. They were able to accomplish that at a great number that locks up Aaron Nola for seven years. Cool. Totally fine with that. Then the next thing you needed to do was, well, you got to find more bench depth. You have to. 
the bench last year was Jake Cave and Cody Clemens and their call and guys like that that just did not make enough of it. Josh Harrison didn't make enough of an impact. So you go out and you sign a guy who's going to be a bench player on this team, probably going to be a bench player on this team, in Whit Merrifield that was an all-star last year that's a veteran player that's just a proven offensive talent and defensive talent. Your bench depth improved immensely. Your pitching improved immensely based on what it could have been if Aaron Nola hadn't signed here. Remember, Blake Snell, no news yet. Jordan Montgomery, no news yet. Yamamoto and Otani were always going to L.A. They just were. Like, that's just how it works. I mean, well, Otani, I think, was more variable. But once he goes there, Yamamoto was always going to L.A. And the Phillies, even knowing that, made him a sizable offer which was a smart move by Dave Dombrowski and John Middleton, the Phillies, to show that they are willing to shell out for next-level talent. If Yamamoto didn't want to play here, you can't fault that on the Phillies organization. That's just the individual player choosing to play somewhere else. So I think they handled that perfectly as well. But you look at it and you say, okay, bench depth majorly improved. Starting rotation, if you didn't have Nola, that would have been a huge step back. So majorly improved. Like, Could you tell me if Aaron Nola didn't exist right now, if he was on some other team, who would be the fifth starter for this team? Who? What? Dylan Covey? Matt Strom? Would you have re-signed Michael Lorenzen? Like, you, you don't have other great options. Would you have called up Mick Abel or Griff McGarry? Those guys don't really seem ready. And they're certainly, even if they are ready to pitch in some capacity at the major league level this year, they're not Aaron Nola. They're just not right now. They could be one day. So that's huge. So you took care of your two big needs. You got a bunch of guys that are variable type players, either minor league contracts, guys with starting experience and bullpen experience, or guys with options that you're looking at, bringing them in off waivers to add to the bullpen depth and give yourself more roster versatility. They did that. And then when everything was said and done about this year's roster and you felt good that you had 26 players or we'll call it 24 because there's still two bullpen spots. I'm really questioning what's going on there. And that's something that still could happen in like minor moves. But they have enough pieces to potentially fold those. So let's go 24 players. You have 24 players that you feel very confident in making an excellent major league roster. So what's the next priority? Well, you go and you spend money on re-signing Zach Wheeler. And that way, you have your two aces together for the next three seasons. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, four seasons while you compete for a championship. That's it. They've solidified their future for the next two, three, four years. I mean, it's going to get a little dicey. When Kyle Schwarber and JT Romuto's contracts come up in two years, but like for the next two years at least, the Philadelphia Phillies are as well set as anyone in baseball. That includes the Dodgers, that includes the Braves, that includes the Yankees, that includes the Rangers, that includes the Orioles, that includes the Astros, that includes the who's who of contenders in baseball. The Philadelphia Phillies are right there with all of them. And you know why they are? Because Dave Dombrowski knew what his team needed this offseason. He was patient about doing it. He got great deals on all these players, and he retooled the roster slightly in a way he needed to. The other thing that you need to remember, last year, was the Phillies starting pitching good? Yes. Was their bullpen good? Yes. Was their offense good? Yes. Was their defense good once Kyle Schwarber wasn't playing left field? Yes. Like, they they just they have everything they need. As much as people talk about buying a World Series and investing money and building a juggernaut team, there's only so much you can guarantee in a sport like baseball. You can't hit a – there's luxury tax thresholds, right? There is no threshold that says, oh, you got this many talented players, we're guaranteeing you a World Series. The best you can do is put yourself in the conversation, solidly in the conversation for best team in baseball, and then let the chips fall where they may. And that is exactly what the Philadelphia Phillies have done this offseason. So everyone who was worried about running it back or them not being active in free agency, why haven't they done anything? Why haven't they addressed this position or that position? They just they 
they ended up doing all of that. And this is a lesson that I try and teach every year. Be very patient. Dave Dombrowski knows what he's doing. He's not Matt Klintak. He is a future Hall of Famer as a front office member and a great president of baseball operations. So an outstanding offseason for the Philadelphia Phillies. Now that it seems that all the big transactions are said and done, another reason I say that is because Jordan Montgomery wants too much money in too many years. Blake Snell wants too much money in too many years. There's a reason they haven't been signed by anybody else. But even if the Phillies were looking at that, they can't really commit that money anymore to those players because of the Zach Wheeler extension that kicks in next year. Because that's going to really just crush them when it comes to next season's offseason, who they can pay, who they can't pay, all that stuff. They don't need to retain many guys, but then two years, Schwarber's going to be a free agent. Muto's going to be a free agent. Castellanos the year after that. I mean, they they got a bunch of guys they got to take care of as far as important position players. They don't need another starter. They don't. And they have three young starting prospects that are highly touted. Griff McGarry, Mick Abel, and Andrew Painter. Don't forget about him. He's got to come back from Tommy John surgery. We'll see what he is. But So this offseason was handled perfectly by the Philadelphia Phillies. And let this be a lesson to Phillies fans. I tried to tell you all offseason. I'll try to tell you again now that it's completed. Be patient. Dave Nebrowski knows what he's doing. This team does not need that much to compete. And they're going to highly compete this year based on a, a near perfect offseason from Dave Dombrowski and the Philadelphia Phillies. Coming up next, we're going to talk about some spring training stats. And I'm going to tell you who's tearing up spring training, who's not so much tearing up spring training. And if there's anybody on the roster you should be worried about, anyone trying to make the roster that's making a push or struggling and Guys that have just played their way out of contention. So we'll talk about that coming up, mainly looking at position players, hitters, by the way. The pitchers, it's very hard to evaluate because they get such weird innings. But we'll talk about some spring training stats as we continue today's episode of Locked On Phillies. Oh, but we've got a new sponsor to tell you about, Prize Picks. If you haven't heard of Prize Picks, you got to listen up, okay? Football season, it may be over. But the action on the floor is heating up. And, you know, it could be tournament season. It could be the fight for home court in the playoffs. There's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. And you can get in on the excitement with prize picks. They're America's number one fantasy sports app. You can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Listen to some of this. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as Four correct picks. You got to get four right. And you can win 100 times your money. That's turning $10 into $1,000. It's not just basketball, right? It's not just the NBA. You can do it with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. I mean, you've absolutely got ways to put that all together. And that's going to be an awesome way for you to try and go about making some money. It's such an easy app to use. The interface is very friendly. You just go through, you pick the sport, you pick the team, you pick the player, you pick the stat, and you pick whether they're going to go over or under that number. I'll even give you a couple. You remember I told you you got to hit four to win 100 times your money? You can do it that way. Well, the, the Philadelphia 76ers play tonight, and they're playing the Brooklyn Nets. I think Tyrese Maxey, he's been on an absolute heater lately. I'm going to take his over in points. And who plays for the Nets, or at least sometimes plays for the Nets? Ben Simmons. You want a safe one? Take his under in everything. That dude doesn't want to play basketball anymore. You know Ben Simmons if you're a Philadelphia sports fan. Those are the two things I'd be looking at. So take a peek at those. See if you can make some money on it. Go ahead and check out Prize Picks. So download the app today and use code Locked On MLB. For a first deposit match up to $100. Again, you can download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB, and you'll get a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's really that easy. So, who's been tearing up spring training? Who's been in good shape 
down in Clearwater. Well, I don't really want to use the pitcher stats yet because pitchers more often than not are working on things, especially guys that you'd expect to make the major league roster. They're working on different things as far as maybe a new pitch, maybe a location they struggled with last year, a whole bunch of stuff like that. So we're going to set them aside for a little bit. Remember, we got our opening day countdown coming up. Still 23 days till opening day. It's a lot of baseball games and a lot of stats to get. Just to give you an idea of like how few opportunities players have gotten because of just how many players are in spring training. When we look at the position players, right? Johan Rojas has the most at-bats of any player on the Philadelphia Phillies uh, spring training roster. He's only got 20. It's not like you're getting 150 at-bats down in spring training. So that's why it's also so tough to evaluate as fans. We only see the in-game at-bats, the ones that are televised, or we listen to the ones on the radio. What we don't see is the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of swings that these guys go through in the cage, the simulated at-bats, the pitch tracking, the drill work, all of this stuff you don't really get access to is just a, a fan of the team, which is annoying about spring training. I'm sure we'd love to know all of this stuff, but that's why reporting super important and trying to read articles from people down there. But I say that to say this, take the numbers with a grain of salt, but there have been some guys that have absolutely been tearing up spring training when it comes to batting wise. Um, now Alec Bohm doesn't really, eh, he's, he's five for seven. So, Again, you ever gone to an early season game and you saw some dude batting like 800? Like that obviously isn't going to carry. But Alec Bohm's hitting 714 and he's got a home run. He's got three RBIs. Alec Bohm looks really, really good in the spring. Um, another guy that I've been asked about a lot, right? Aramis Garcia. He's a catcher. He's been having himself a solid spring training, right? He's batting 533. He's got a couple of walks. 14 total base. He's got a home run. He's got five RBIs. I mean, he's really been putting together good at bats. And people have been asking me, is there any way he catches Garrett Stubbs? There's just, there's not. Like, as much as he's having a nice spring training, the familiarity between Garrett Stubbs and these pitchers, and you've got the same rotation as you had last year, like, that's a very important thing as well. Stubbs would have to do something to, like, really lose his roster spot. And he's got, what does he have, nine at-bats. Um, he's got two hits. I mean, it's not great by any stretch of the imagination what Garrett Stubbs is doing, but defensively he's been fine. Uh, he's just – the Phillies are comfortable with him. It's not a position of significant need for the Phillies. It is nice to see Garcia playing well in case something happens to Stubbs as far as injury. Uh, Rafael Marchand has had a bit of a bang-up himself as far as injury, but – He's another guy that could potentially be an option if Stubbs or Real Muto are hurt. But none of these guys are really exceptional options. So the Phillies are going to go with the guy they know, which is Garrett Stubbs. Some other guys that are uh, doing really, really well in spring training. Trey, Tur Look at this one. Trey Turner is batting 385 in spring training. Now he's got 13 at-bats. So he's 5 for 13. He's got two doubles. He's got two RBIs, seven total bases. He's got a walk. Uh, like... Trey Turner is starting to look like more the Trey Turner you'd expect him to. Um, Scott Kingery is tearing up spring training. Nine at bats, he's got four hits, he's got four runs scored, two homers. Like he's walked three times, he's not going to make the team. But here's the thing about Scott Kingery that is good too, right? It's good to see these players that you think, hmm, wow, they're they're making a bit of an impact. That's good to see. Because in case major injuries become an issue, let's say three guys get hurt at the same position, knock on wood. But that would be catastrophic. Uh, but you have a guy that's a versatile defender in Scott Kingery that's going to be down at AAA. And that's something to hold on to, to keep in mind if there's major injury issues. They're not going to make the team, but it, it adds depth. Guys like Weston Wilson having a nice spring. Uh, guys like Scott Kingery, like we talked about, having a nice spring. Christian Pache, if he doesn't make the team. Uh, Derek Hall hasn't really been doing all that much. He's one for 13. That's not great. He's not really making a case. Um, yeah, there's not really Cody Clemens is six for 12. 
he's shown a little bit. I don't think he's going to make the team. Like, I really think there's just too few roster spots available. Here are the biggest guys that I'm looking at as far as numbers, though. So Rojas is four for 20, batting 200, which is not too big of a deal. We talked about this with Garrett Stubbs. The issue is he's walked zero times. He struck out six times. He struck out six times in 20 at-bats. That's an issue for Johan Rojas, and that kind of points you in the direction of him not recognizing the baseball the way that he needs to. If that continues, he could really potentially be on a path to the minors, which means Merrifield's going to start, which means Pache may be one bench bat and Jake Cave another. And, yeah, it's just – I don't know. It makes things a lot more complicated if Rojas doesn't pick it up. So not hitting the panic button yet on Rojas, but just need to see more out of him. And then Christian Pache has had a really darn good start to the spring in 13 at bats. He's only got four hits, right? He's, it's not like he's hitting crazy well for average, but two of those are home runs. He's got three RBIs, 10 total bases, a nice walk there. But he's also struck out four times. So it's like, I don't know. You've got athletic guys. They're showing off some ability, but not consistency. And that's why this is getting so complicated. So. Uh, I'll have my latest opening day roster prediction for you on Friday, as I always do. And, hey, man, if things don't change, maybe Rojas could be on the outside looking in this week. And we'll always update what the pitchers are doing. I think I need to make a change because there's a guy whose name has become pretty popular pitching-wise for the Phillies. So we'll talk about that on Friday's episode. But, uh, yeah, just wanted to give you an update on some of the numbers from spring training and what they mean for what players are performing and what players aren't. Coming up, as we wrap up Locked on Phillies, we got our opening day countdown. Who is the best number 23 in Philadelphia Phillies history? Oh, I'll tell you who I think it is coming up as we wrap up Locked on Phillies. Let me tell you about FanDuel first, though. You can get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Or sorry, if your bet wins and your team, you know how it is. If you bet on a team, if you bet on a player prop, all of that, your bet wins 150 bucks in your account that you can use to wager on all kinds of different stuff. And you can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays. So you get a better chance to feel the flow of the game first. Exclusive props that you can only find on FanDuel and plenty more, including your old favorites. Money line bets, spread bets, over-unders, futures, uh, player props. All that kind of stuff. Just visit Fandle.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. Fandle, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. So who's the best number 23 in Philadelphia Phillies history? Who could it possibly be? This is another one of those weird numbers where there's not a clear like breakout candidate for it. Recently, Here are some of the names that you may remember from recent Phillies teams. Cody Clemens wore it last year. Corey Knebel wore it in 2022. Or Knebel, because people called him Evil Knebel, but I think it's pronounced Knebel. Anyway, Archie Bradley in 2021. Kyle Garlick in 2020. Jay Bruce in 2019. I mean, who could forget Aaron Altair wearing it from 2016 to 2019? You've had, it's a popular number. You've had a lot of guys wear it recently, but. Just no one who's been all that good. Placido Polanco wore it for a year back in 2002. We already have Placido Polanco on the list, I believe. Um, Some other names that I just recognized. Todd Pratt wore it from 92 to 93. Um, When you go further back, there are some great names down on the list uh, that I'm not familiar with. I just like names. Jennings Point Dexter from 1939 wore number 23. Uh, Cy Moore, he's like... Cy Young, but more, I guess. I, I don't know. He wore in 1933. There's a bunch of guys that were, I think, 60 total players and worn the number 23 for the Philadelphia Phillies. But I'm going to give it to a member of the 1980 World Series winning team. He's the only player, because no one in 2008 wore the number 23, to wear this number for a World Series winning team. So for that reason, it's got to be Greg Gross, who wore the number from 79 to 82. A guy who was... A pinch hitter, a bench bat, played the outfield, played a little bit of first base, but he was a guy that kind of came off the bench. Somewhat what they're looking, not quite what Whit Merrifield's going to be. I'd imagine Whit Merrifield's going to be better, but kind of in that role where it's just like you can play multiple places, you can hit in big spots, and 
he was big during his time with the Philadelphia Phillies for adding bench depth. Great teams have bench depth. World Series winning teams have bench depth. And Greg Gross was great bench depth for the 1980 team. So that's why, in my opinion, he's the best number 23 in Philadelphia Phillies history. That's all for today's episode. So thank you so much for checking us out. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to the YouTube, all that great stuff. I appreciate that as we talked about. Once again, we're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I'll talk to you next time on the next episode of Locked On Phillies.